Thank you very much. Uh, the truth is, Jeremy, that after the lovely masterclass we held this afternoon with some postgraduates and some colleagues who are still postgraduates in spirit, even if they're very senior in, in reality, um, I feel like I should just you know, put this aside, write another lecture, because I've learned so much from them. But nonetheless, you'll get what I have to offer, and I hope it'll be interesting. And I shall uh, occasionally refer to yesterday's lecture or tomorrow's lecture, but I'm fully aware that you're all very busy people and only very few will be able to actually come to all lectures. So please don't feel excluded. It's just a way of organizing my own thinking over the last few months as to how these lectures unfold. So in this lecture, I shall interpret the title uh, the Jewish body, as you see there in inverted commas, extremely broadly. The bodies of Jews, the body is understood by Jews, the body is fantasized and imagined by Jews and of Jews. Now, the body became a subject of concerted study, I think probably it's right to say in the 1980s. A part of what we heard yesterday that Robert Danton thought about all these new histories as a very odd turn in history. Um, and he claimed that because he thought that far too much attention was being paid to, oh, the sick, criminals, marginals. You remember that quote from if you were here, if you were here yesterday. In fact, what he was sort of lamenting was the fact that, um, you know, some historians uh, were very inspired by what may seem to be the well-known nihilism of some well-known French scholars. But that wasn't a totally bad thing. In my view, um, those historians who started taking the body seriously were interested in the body as a focus of research because of a number of really very serious intellectual developments that were taking place around them. There was, in the, even in the interwar uh, period, let alone in the mid-century, a real draw amongst uh, intellectuals, particularly in Europe, towards a phenomenological reflection, what I'd like to think really means in simpler terms, a sort of a way of studying uh, systematically, perhaps, that great subjectivity that is the human, to think of intellectual projects which attempted to uh, combine um, the awareness that the human condition is, is fragile. It's uh, engaged and uh, dwells within a fragile body. And I like to think that it is not unconnected to the fact that these thinkers were operating in a world that had already experienced uh, mass killing of wholly new dimensions, let alone, of course, the genocides of mid-century and later. So if we think of uh, really important thinkers like uh, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, Jean-Paul Sartre, Paul Ricoeur, and of course the very great Emmanuel Levinas, each, in his way, explored the possibilities and the limitations of the embodied human, subject to pain, host to exaltation, victim to systems of surveillance and discipline that Michel Foucault, of course, has made us think of very seriously. There were, I'm not claiming that all historians who, uh, who um, went on to study the body were fully aware of this body of work or had read it very uh, systematically. But I do think that it was very much in the background of some of the crucial thinkers' uh, projects, like Foucault himself, of course. Most historians probably uh, encountered it at the level of just finding something that they want to work about because they uh, saw the body prompted through some of the new engagements, the interdisciplinary engagements that Jeremy mentioned, uh, operating upon history at the time. So for example, there was that uh, bringing together, coming together of anthropology and history, which of course puts ritual to the fore. And with it, the ritual, you see bodies doing interesting things, uh, uh, interacting and producing knowledge and experience. Um, the whole coming of gender to our consciousness, of course, was uh, dramatic. It's about, of course, the making of identities through bodies, the making of the bodily difference, man, woman, to make of it some sort of cultural good. And then there was that really all embracing uh, all the reaches of social history or indeed that more sort of, that, that particularly materially oriented uh, version of it that is captured in the term Alltagsgeschichte, which is the history of people in their lives as they eat and they work and they play and enjoy themselves and so on. And then within those bodies, I think, and very much more recently, there was, I think, a realization that the body might uh, work and eat and struggle and feel pain, but the body is also producing something else, which is emotion. 
and very, very recently, historians are identifying themselves as historians of emotions, whatever that may mean. But we'll return to that later. Now, reflection on the embodied state of being, on how reality appears to humans, how it is processed, shared, and experienced through the body, is a set of challenges historians now relish. And I think we know a great deal more thanks to this turn. Think of how the body has been produced the most extraordinary new type of history of medicine that, of course, the, the welcome unit um, um, at Manchester uh, had contributed so much to this through the work of its um, uh, of its uh, members, or the history of of, of politics, of course, uh, uh, all these possibilities there, but caught my eye, particularly in the context of the French Revolution, a great deal. Or the body has led people to perceive the imperial and colonial relationship more sharply within uh, post-colonial uh, with post-colonial sensibilities that observe the way in which a particular colonial subject was constructed, or indeed um, richly and, uh, and something that interests me very much, the whole way in which uh, religious discipline and fantasy has worked through the body in all traditions and uh, religious practices of, of, of and, and, and excitation that leads to sort of to um, uh, collective action very often. So all of that, all of that new work of history through the body is now not only there and something that we do as a matter of course, but it's also led, as I said, and you can sort of see why from just these few examples, into this field of the history of emotions to which I shall return. And in the history of the emotions, you find historians interacting not so much with anthropologists, but rather uh, with neuroscientists and um, psychologists sometimes. So medieval people thought about the body and the person as deeply intertwined. The classical scientific knowledge, which governed thinking about medicine too, understood the body as made of a sort of combination of um, dispositions in a way, related also to cosmic. Oh, there's writing on the body is another area. So the body is then um, made up of different humors that reside within it. In that case, that's actually a female body. And that big circle at the top is actually, at the top of the chest, is actually the womb, because the womb was understood to be something that traveled around throughout the body, mobile, and creating very special situations for women, as you can imagine. So that body is made up of humors, which are in themselves related to the operation of uh, cosmological planetary forces. Of course, you see there the famous zodiac person, zodiac man, uh, uh, trying to link up the rhythms of uh, bleeding to particular dispositions of um, the planets. It, so it was obviously the body lived under the forces operated, these cosmological, co cosmic forces, but also the fluids that it produced naturally, that occurred naturally within it. The person emerged from a combination then of matter and spirit too. And each individual was in a way a unique cocktail, a unique blending of all those humors. And according to that blend could be um, diversely uh, choleric or phlegmatic or melancholic or sanguine indeed. This grid of natural bodily conditions was understood to be always in flux as well. And the balance struck by each and one of the bodies was also much to be determined by the regimen of food and bodily care undertaken by each individual and indeed by individuals within particular communities of practice as well, say like a monastery. Men were vigorous in their heat, so religious men sought sometimes to lessen their distracting masculinity and sexual drive by eating cooling foods like vegetables and by avoiding spices. This also meant that colder men grew a thinner beard and had smaller testicles. They were more like women. Women, in turn, who sought, uh, who for reasons spiritual, religious, sought to be more virile and to eschew their very embodied femininity, might seek sources of heat to compensate for their natural wetness. Uh, we know, for example, that um, um, uh, Katerina of Siena used to habitually hang out in the hottest parts of baths in order to just infuse herself with heat. But most treatment expected a fundamental difference between men and women to endure in all areas of life, rendering men more amenable to the use of reason, less tied down to the body and its demands. In women, the presence of that roaming womb 
uh, was seen as a particularly conducive to a sort of temperamental uh, um, disposition and to many distinctive illnesses. So the person could be monitored and changed in keeping with a suitable regimen, made more virtuous, less inclined to sexual appetite or to anger or to sadness. And if that were the case, where are we in those situations where actually keeping the difference between people, between certain types of person, like for example Jew and Christian, is quite important to preserve that difference as unbridgeable. Medieval preachers emphasized the malleability of women, their proneness to influence for good and for bad. The fixity of maleness combined in the Jew with the mark of circumcision, of course, and both branded him with an essential character, obdurate, literally reasoning, and actively cunning. The Jew sometimes appeared as more man than any other, but he was also occasionally stigmatized with the disabilities associated in that culture and many others with femininity, like guile and dissimulation, lack of courage and lack of honor. So you notice so far that I'm talking about the Jew, but this is a highly gendered category itself. Most discussions of Jews in medieval Europe were in fact discussions of men. In fact, my dear friend Sarah Lipton, who we mentioned below, is just finishing her really, uh, it's gonna be an amazing book, The Jew in Medieval Art. And she has a whole chapter of where were the Jewish women sort of thing, because you very rarely get them represented. We'll explore that in a minute. So male Jews were quintessential Jews, their bodies irreversibly marked by circumcision. The male Jew was imagined bound to the law, keeper of its letter. The Jew was a reader of the Bible, yes, as we saw when the Jew Leo expounded uh, yesterday in the text that we read uh, from Odo of Tournay, but he was one who read it carnally, carnaliter. Such reading failed to understand the Bible in the age of grace, spiritually. It missed the point, failed to grasp that prophecy had been fulfilled with the coming of Christ. Carnal Israel was a congregation of men, and the offenses imagined as committed by Jews habitually ranging from the horrific imaginings of child murder to host desecration to, to, to poisonings of all types were overwhelmingly, I mean, almost totally, always attributed to men or to groups of men. Now, there was a real confusion in the categories and sentiments associated with Jews. Well, that goes without saying. Uh, the Jew was treated, as I say, mostly as a man. But as a man, deformed too. The Jew was a social being. He fulfilled the role of breadwinner, clearly educator of his children and liturgical actor in synagogue and home, and learned in the power of reason, uh, reason a male quality too. He reasons, he reasons at that lev low level uh, attributed to the Jew, but he was an imperfect man too, without that propensity to elevate himself and to reach for, within his Jewish body, to reach for the level of illumination. The medieval categories of body and personhood thus provided the tools uh, by which the Jew could be seen as both feeble, like a woman, and sinister, like a man. These categories sometimes are applied in an extremely um, let us say, arbitrary or, or mechan mechanistic level, uh, mechanistic fashion. I always think of um, uh, this uh, very, very famous theologian, Henry of Ghent, who was a, a very, very important theologian in the very last years of the, of the 13th century in Paris. And he produced some really important work about the resurrection and the relationship of body and soul and whatnot. And along those paths, he once finds himself asking, why are the Jews always so melancholy? Well, we know this answer going back, you know, to the patristic era. They're melancholy, they're, they're obviously they're in exile, they've been rejected and whatnot. But he says, and as we've learned from Peter Biller, his discussion tries to use exactly these sort of Aristotelian stroke Galenic humoral um, uh, causes and terms. So he says, aha, and it's usually the logic is, is it always unfolds, as it were, inexorably. The Jews, they eat all those very dry meats because of the way they, they, they um, uh, slaughter and then prepare meat. So their meats are really dry and flavorless. So then they have to put a lot of uh, spices into them, and spices are really bad for you, and they always have indigestion. Hence, the Jews are melancholy. Okay. Unhealthy eating made them morose. 
The body marked by its Jewishness was an obstacle to change, and it thus stood in the way of conversion too, and conversion of course is very important. Indeed, the most famous account of the conversion of a Jew in the Middle Ages, I think, is that of Hermann, once the Jew, quondam Judeus. This account, which was supposed to have happened in the early 12th century, but survives from two manuscripts in circa 1200, tells of the conversion of a young Jew, Yehuda ben David Halevi, from Cologne. He was sent on business to Münster, where the Bishop of Münster owed his family an enormous amount of money. It was given without security, so they sent the son in a peculiar sort of inverted form of sort of hostage uh, to be there in Münster and to sort of follow the bishop around so they're sure that they'll get their money back at some point. While waiting there, you know, and sort of biding his time, he actually spends some time, clearly he's stalking the bishop, so he actually gets to hear the bishop's sermons. So he learns a lot from that, and he's very interested, and one day he actually enters into the cathedral to hear this bishop, indebted bishop, uh, preach. And there he enters the cathedral, and at the heart of the cathedral he sees, he is horrified by a crucifix, a crucifix with a body hanging from it, you know, and he considers this to be some sort of idol, and he's absolutely appalled. So he raises this with people he meets, and he ends up meeting and discussing this with someone in the bishop's entourage at that moment, who is a very important early 12th century theologian, Rupert of Deutz. And um, Rupert of Deutz is obviously very patient, and he explains to him, that you must simply see that crucifix, that body hanging there, as a testimony, as a sign. And after all, the Jewish Bible is full of signs given by God to his people. Okay, so Judah is sort of processing that. He continues to be quite interested in Christianity. He ultimately, and it's a great wrench with his family, as you can imagine, he is eventually baptized. Uh, he becomes a member of the House of Augustinian Canons in Kappenberg, which isn't far from Cologne, and then was actually ordained to the priesthood. But Hermann was still quondam Judeus. This is an important quality that follows him around, as many other converts, prominent converts were. And when his tomb was opened in the 17th century, identified and opened in the 17th century, the effigy, or rather when, when it was found under, under layers, through the digging up of the, uh, of the floor in Kapp Kappenberg, the effigy engraved on it was Hermann's effigy appearing as an Augustinian canon, but with a Jewish hat at his feet. There is a great deal of confusion in the discussion of the appearance of Jews in the Middle Ages. Much is made of the fact that Jews were often shown wearing a distinctive hat. What are we to make of it? Well, the distinctive oriental hat was a well-established figure uh, representing, on the whole, as Sarah Lipton, I think, very convincingly shows, men we might describe as uh, men of noble antiquity. So our examples here show um, uh, prophets, or as you see here, the magi, who wear this sort of triangular hat in contexts that have nothing to do with Jews. She also very kindly shared with me this image that used to be taken uh, of, as being a Jew uh, pressing grapes, and uh, she absolutely dismisses it. There's also no reason in that particular calendar for it to be a Jew. It's a guy with a hat on his head. So people have gone rather far in identifying uh, hats of all descriptions as being Jewish hats. But also she has shown that the Jewish hat enters at a very particular moment, and she, she, she thinks that the earliest she can date it is to around 1160, in that 12th century we've been returning to so often. And then when Jews appear in, uh, in their hats, they can appear variously as, like here, Old Testament Jews, you will notice in, you will notice in the uh, third round on the left from the top, um, in this Bible Moralisé, or uh, Jew, somebody who was a Jew in the Christian tradition, this here being a nativity panel, and that of course is poor old Joseph, or you can get it uh, in this case of the famous um, of the famous uh, Jewish minstrel, Suskin von uh, Trimberg there, who uh, is addressing his patrons in this important manuscript, which includes a number of his compositions. 
or indeed in Jewish manuscripts over there, like in the famous Bird's Head Haggadah. So I work with the assumption that um, the Jewish hat is not necessarily a statement about social practice. It is rather an extremely freighted and interesting uh, sort of marker that we should take very seriously when it appears, when it appears in, um, in, visual, in visual representations. But we have no reason to think that it relates to a particular fashion or mode of, of, um, of, of sartorial practice of Jews at the time. Indeed, it's very hard to tell apart Jews and Christians in our period. It was vexing both to Jewish and to Christian leaders. Jews didn't want, uh, uh, Jewish leaders didn't want Jews dressing up what they called as Gentiles, but um, they clearly did. And there's repeated condemnation of certain fashionable pursuits. Um, and for that reason, that it's very hard to tell Jews and Christians apart, famously, Pope Innocent III in 1215, one of his uh, in one of the uh, canons of that most famous of all medieval councils, the Fourth Ca Lateran Council, of course, decreed that Jews and Muslims should wear a sign. And let's read this together because it says, in some provinces, a difference in dress distinguishes the Jews or Saracens from the Christians. But in certain others, such a confusion has grown up that they cannot be distinguished by any difference. Thus it happens at times that through error Christians have relations with women of Jews or Saracens, and Jews and Saracens with Christian women. Therefore, that they may not, under pretext of error of this sort, excuse themselves in the future for the excesses of such prohibited intercourse, we decree that such Jews and Saracens of both sexes in every Christian province and at all times shall be marked off in the eyes of the public from other peoples through the character of their dress. Now, um, we do have marked dressing in the Middle Ages, and we do have repeated legislation. For example, in some late medieval cities, prostitutes had to wear scarves or skirts or belts of particular colors in order to mark them apart. What we do know, uh, as much as we do know, and there is also some discussions in, in response of this, and what we know also from uh, occasional comment by uh, Christians who don't approve of it, on the whole, this decree was not, was not applied, was not enforced. Like most of the decrees of Lateran IV, it was indeed then repeated by bishops in each one of the countries, because the idea was that Lateran IV Council is then sort of spread by bishops in all their different, by archbishops and bishops in all their different uh, provinces and dioceses. And it is repeated in a number of councils, for example, in early 13th century England and northern France. But we know more about exemptions from it, from, for which we have some documentation from, from Italy, then again, it would have to be shown that Jews went about marked in this way. Jews and Christian inhabited European spaces and places abundant with bodily imagery. In the 11th century, three-dimensional figurative works became a favorite way of representing dignity and majesty. I mean, when you think of it, it's right, quite striking that we really get what we call sort of statues, I mean, religious statues in the round to be seen from around, really only become common around the year 1000. I always think that uh, that Golden Madonna, for obvious reasons, from Essen is, uh, is one of the um, early examples and a very striking example of that. Uh, so there is probably far more, there, there are more uh, figures to be seen. There is more contemplation of the body in various situations. And we're not talking just religious, we're talking also obviously secular statuary uh, as our period progresses after the year 1000 or so. So the human body was explored within the formative and powerful narratives of Christianity, of course, and two really important developments converge strongly in the 12th century to produce hyper-awareness and engagement with the body. These are the growing role of narratives about maternity and generation associated, of course, with the cult of the Virgin Mary. And this also enhanced awareness of the infant's body about which I shall talk tomorrow in the lecture about ch children in this culture and children and Jews. And there was then the new and overwhelming presence of the Corpus Christi, in this case here carried in a monstrance in a, as depicted in a 14th century manuscript, of the presence of Christ's body, the Eucharist, what promised to be Christ's body when it is the consecrated uh, host. Here was a challenge and a promise to Christians. Here was a perplexing oddity for the Jews. 
The emphasis on Mary's agency, her power to intercede and to act in the world, was experienced and formulated, represented and celebrated in liturgies in the hundreds, literally, if not more thousand, more, close over a thousand, over a thousand of new religious houses that were founded between 1100 and 1200. Sisters and claimed to be particularly devoted to the Virgin Mary, but good old Benedictines were also innovators in her service. After all, it was the monk Anselm who inserted her into the scheme of redemption as a most fitting vessel for a god incarnate, and also composed meditations and prayers for her. In the 13th century, with the advent of the Franciscan order, a whole new range of possibilities was explored of Jesus in his vulnerable humanity and of his mother in her familiar maternity. There were cribs to be had and religious drama, all the accoutrement of celebrating that very bodily nurturing link between the two, and increasingly in the 13th century, in vernacular words, in vernacular sounds, which planted center stage a drama of salvation, which was body-centered, often around the child Christ, engaged in new ways with the nurturing body of his mother. I've come to think about this abundant physicality in new ways, thanks to some scholars who've uh, really brought, as I mentioned earlier, the emotions uh, to the fore. And just a moment about them, because the work that they're doing, which is extremely interesting, and I happen to be quite, you know, at the heart of it, simply because in my school of history at Queen Mary, uh, we are home to, the, to a uh, center for the uh, history of the emotions. So by importing and refining concepts uh, from, from other disciplines, uh, scholars like Roger Smith and William Reddy have taught us to identify and query emotions as they appear in our sources and do something useful and enlightening now that we notice them more in our sources. And um, so I don't consider myself a historian of the emotions, nor do I recommend that any of you convert to becoming a historian of the emotions. But I do think it's sort of helpful to think about the emotions. And I thought, therefore, perhaps to pursue something that occurred to me thinking through emotions, particularly hearing a paper about disgust, and uh, through our sources, which are Jewish Christian related. So being a aware of emotions means looking at our sources somewhat differently to identify valences that we may not have seen otherwise. So when working on Jewish Christian relations through texts and images, I've often noted the association of Jews with dirt and excrement. Uh, only recently have I begun thinking about disgust a little bit more systematically. And indeed, it's, a, it's, it's, it's very powerful, isn't it? Uh, Kant described it as something that just disgust just penetrates the body so far as it is alive. Disgust is the result of what seems to be an unwelcome, even horrifying intrusion into ourselves, it threatens. Disgust was expressed by Jews as they contemplated the embodied divinity uh, and by Christians on occasion as they observed Jews outside the circle of grace. Jews attached the language of disgust to the idea of an incarnate God. It can be glimpsed in the earliest versions, of course, of the Toldot Yeshu, that counter history which parodied Jesus as a good for nothing magician surrounded by scoundrels as his followers. This tradition was in place very early on, with traces, of course, already in the fifth century. But it also developed in the Middle Ages, and there's now a fantastic research project in Princeton, which is trying to, to um, it's, it's a very hidden tradition, because obviously Jewish scholars, you know, did not want to deal with it too openly over the centuries, and those who dealt with it were usually polemicists, uh, a Christian polemicists, collecting, as it were, data on abu uh, the abuses of, of the Jews, and, and now it, it'll be really, really useful to have the fantastic very, very complex linea lineages of, of texts and transmissions that we're looking forward to coming out of Princeton. But disgust clearly permeates the relationships, and I think disgust comes out most, and I think probably in most of us, uh, uh, at moments of, 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 of real crisis, uh, of moments of fear and of moments of, of um, uh, when you know, the, the social order seems to be really not, not, not there and the unexpected is occurring all around one, like indeed it was in 1096, in April 1096, four Jews in the communities of the Rhineland found themselves, despite the efforts of bishops to hide them and to, to bribe away the, the armed pilgrims, the, the, the crusade, those who were going on what will become the crusade, uh, they, they nonetheless um, 
obviously find themselves in a situation where they were threatened and often threatened with forced to convert or just you know killed outright or whatever. And uh, there's a tremendous amount of uh, a, a poetical lament that has resulted, which has enriched deeply the sort of medieval well, and the legacy of the Middle Ages in the Jewish tradition. And we have a number of chronicles too. But uh, just to give you a sense of the, of, the, of, the, of the laments as they arise from that period, I think I have them. Sort of things that are coming out as the dead are remembered. The Gentiles call their holiness, which is a sin of lechery, a child who is born of a mother but not from his father, as it were. Your chosen ones reject the lineage of a woman of lechery, Mary. The Gentiles raise an image higher than God. Your people bear witness to your lordship, God of gods. The Gentiles have a defeated corpse as their nonsensical folly. Your cohort have you, has you as holy seated in praise. Obviously, it's my translation from the Hebrew, so it maybe doesn't work as well, well definitely doesn't work as well as the original. So you, hear, you see here this sort of like dialectical, the Gentiles and the Jews, and you see here a concentration on these, all the sort of indignities like, you know, lechery, defeated corpse, associated with bringing divinity into a fallible and even sinful body. In the narrative of the persecutions from Mainz in 1096, a group of maidens about to commit suicide as an act of martyrdom, Kiddush Hashem, cried out from the window of their chambers, Look and behold, O Lord, what we are doing to sanctify thy great name in order not to exchange your divinity for a crucified scion who was despised, abominated, and held in contempt in his own generation, a bastard son conceived by a menstruating and wanton woman. I shan't go into the details of the menstruating and wanton woman, but those who are versed in the Jewish tradition will, of course, uh, know that the word used is nida, and that is, again, a word used to describe Mary, as it were, in a situation of perpetual uh, impurity because of the irregularity, as it were, of the, uh, of the uh, um, both the conception and the birth of her child. I should just say that in the very same period, or just a few decades later, there is an interesting tract, which a uh, Christian monastic tract, which asks the question, why did Mary have to be purified? After all, Mary was pure because of the circumstances of Christ. She, he wasn't born like every other child, and he wasn't born in sin. And the uh, answer that's given by the monk says, because Mary was full of charity. She did not want to just wantonly disrupt the traditions of her people that she respected. And therefore, she underwent a ritual, which in a way she did not need at all. But also to say that she wanted to keep links with the Jews. She did not want to break off from the Jewish community so as better to facilitate their own conversion, their own recognition of her son. So it's very strong language here that we have tzahana, stench, biush, corruption, tenef, filth. And not only about the Virgin Mary and her incarnate son, but also to describe the water of baptism that was being offered as, as an option, abominable water, as it were. Viewing a Jew dragged into to the font, the 1096 chronicler describes forced conversion. And there was one pious man there whose name was Rabbi Tzchak Halevi, and they tortured him with hard torment, and they made him filthy despite himself, since he knew not what was happening due to the beating he had suffered. So he suffered a beating, as it were, he was concussed, and he was dragged to baptism. Some in Mainz were even more active, animated by disgust at the prospect of Christian symbols. The virgins and the wives and the wives and the bridegrooms looked out of the windows and shouted in great voice, saying, look and see, our God, what we are doing to sanctify your great name without forsaking your divinity for the sake of a hunger crucified, a bedraggled and disgusting corpse, condemned even in his own time, bastard son of uncleanliness and of an adultery. So I need not tell you just how strong this is. It is palpable. Now, there are many levels of analysis that we can apply here, of course. There is a repetition of, of terms that we see throughout these texts. There are all sorts of interesting rhetorical devices, and I'm not saying that this is exactly what people said as they stood uh, you know, about to, to slaughter themselves, but this is the tradition that seemed apt, seemed to capture the sentiment appropriate for people in that situation. 
Now, moving to the other side, disgust prompts strong reactions and responses in the pole polemical engagement that we're returning to, the one we heard about yesterday, by Odo of Tournay, if you remember, the Bishop of Cambrai, uh, whom, uh, who wrote that um, disputation with the Jew Leo concerning the advent of Christ, the Son of God, around 1106. So Leo is imagined, or is he just imagined, or was there a Leo? We can't decide on that. Uh, that there is this sort of discussion over I mean, first the coming of Christ and why the Virgin Mary is necessary as part of the story of salvation. And we see them here in full polemical thrust, I think, more than we did in the texts we read yesterday. So Odo is taking on clearly the accusations brought by Leo that you know it's unlikely and uh, inappropriate that God should reside in a woman's body because of the the, the impurity of a woman's body, all the stuff that's in it, in, within it, and especially the womb. So he says, Odo says, Gabriel said that she is full of grace. You've got that there, yeah. If full, then nothing of her was in any way devoid of grace. So nothing of hers was emptied by sin, whose whole being was filled with grace. Therefore, her sex was filled with glory, her womb was filled with glory, her organs were filled with glory. The whole of her was filled with glory because of the whole of her, because the whole of her was filled with grace. So having established that Mary is absolutely full of grace, as said in the gospel, Odo then turns against the Jew. Where is it that which you called the uncleanliness of women? Returning to this idea, of course, of Nida in a way, the obscene, pers the obscene prison, the fetid womb. Confess, you wretch, your stupidity. In, this in his conception of the virgin became, in his conception, the virgin became the marriage bed of omnipotent God and the sanctuary of the Holy Spirit. The secret places of her blessed womb were the more holy, or rather the more divine, the more intimately divine mysteries grew there. What in all creation is more holy, more clean, more pure than the virgin from whom was assumed that God became, O womb, O flesh, in whom and from whom the creator was created? and God was made incarnate. So wherever there was polemic, there were bodies, and there was disgust too. And I think we've gained a different type of insight into the operations of this type of feeling in the practices um, and, and in a text of a very different nature, which is a text I've been working on, as you know, for quite a while now, uh, which is The Life and Passion of William of Norwich, and I mentioned it already, and if you remember, it's about, it's about um, what it claims that um, a boy who was found in a wood in 1144 uh, during Holy Week was in fact, a 12-year-old boy in Norwich was, was in fact killed by the Jews. And this is a story that had never been told before, and the author of this text is trying to establish it as true, and also to explain and then tell all the miracles that occurred around this boy once he was recognized as a martyr indeed. So the Jews have, as it were, tortured and brought about the death of this boy and uh, during Holy Week, which is also Passover. And then what do they do with the body? This is a real challenge, what to do? So he tells us, this is the way he imagines it. Having accomplished their proposed malice in this way, the Jews consulted each other as to what more was to be done. Took care to remove the lifeless body hanging from the post and entered into collective consultation as to what to do with it. Several said it should be thrown into a privy for greater shame and degradation, that is to heap on extra shame upon the child who was being crucified, as it were, killed in the image of Christ. But some of the clever ones thought that to hide it in the ground, to hide it in the ground, that is not in the privy, but in the ground, lest the Christians somehow manage to find it. Yet the working of divine clemency, which prepared for later times the discovery of so great a martyr, allowed neither that he be cast down the privy, nor that he be hidden in the earth, because he has to be found, right? Therefore, by the provision of the divine plan, sorry, by, yeah, 
therefore, by the provision of the divine plan, making them doubt themselves, not knowing for certain what to do, they all agreed unanimously on the matter that while they carefully reflected on the issue, they should keep him in the meantime in a more hidden place. On the morrow, indeed, as day rose, they met again for the business at hand, and, as we later learned from one of them, while they were still discussing it and not knowing entirely as yet what to do, it is said that a certain person who had considerable authority among them, divine will inspiring and urging him on, gave the following advice. So amongst all the Jews who gave these rather banal answers that aren't totally satisfactory, put him in the ground, throw him in the, throw him in the, in the sewers, um, there's this, this better one. Listen to me. So here is Thomas of Monmouth, the monk of Norwich, speaking in the voice of a wise Jew. Listen to me, brothers, followers of the Lord's law. I consider it utterly useless for us, and I fear greatly the danger which would follow in the future, if the body of this Christian were to be drowned in our privy or concealed in the earth within the area of our houses. Since indeed we dwell in rented houses, if within a month or sooner, when some new reason arises, we move away from these dwellings to others, I fear what might follow after our departure, and I will be greatly amazed if what I fear were not to happen. For once we have left, the Christians who will move in will assuredly inspect everything, and one cannot believe that they will not, to shame us, either cleanse the sewers or fill up the old ones and dig new ones where they wish. What then? It is likely and easy then for the body will be found by the cleaners or the diggers. And having found it, in no way will the deed be imputed to Christians, but the blame for the whole affair will undoubtedly be passed on to us. It does not seem likely that a Christian would have been willing to do such a thing to a Christian, nor, up to a point, Jews to a Jew. But what I think very fascinating here, and I've consulted archaeologists about the matter of sort of sewages and cisterns and whatnot, and it is true that there was occasional digging up and people moving in would dig up, but here it's set up as if the, the Christians would make a particular gesture of saying, ooh, this was a Jewish house. No, we can't, uh, we can't just move in without sort of, as it were, purifying it or fumigating it or whatever, but definitely digging up digging up the, uh, the sewers. And it was really through thinking of disgust that I noticed how extraordinary that conception was if we remember that it's Thomas ventriloquizing, as it were, for a Jew. So the prompts for clashes over such embodied situations grew, I think, m more frequent in the urban centers where, of where civic life and devotional activity developed a pace. And we, we will return on Thursday to this, this issue of, of, of proximity and the sharing of material objects in the lecture about, um, in the Thursday lecture. The spread and growing frequency of Eucharistic experience, of course, led to a great deal of writing and frequent preaching, and often this came to involve Jews too. Jews were useful to think with uh, w about this very difficult and rather new in the late 12th century, after all it was formulated, doctrine of transubstantiation and of course to teach it to the laity. The story of the Jewish boy which we encountered yesterday was bolstered as a quintessentially Eucharistic story now. In new versions, you'll remember that boy uh, uh, received the Eucharist in his mouth and actually it turned into a child or into flesh in his mouth, emphasizing the Eucharistic valence of what had been really in origin, you'll remember, a Marian tale. And there was more. Cities and kingdoms legislated against Jews' presence in the Eucharistic zone of Holy Week in the streets where there were frequent processions and movements. Suspicion arose whenever Pixies like that one there uh, were held and kept as pawns in Jewish houses lest someone might have sort of just not noticed and left a consecrated host within it. So the direction of travel meant that by the end of the 13th century a whole new fantasy became established among the many narratives of European Christian cultures. Not everywhere, not very frequently enacted, but nonetheless there. And that is of course the, the fantasy of the Jew as the enemy of the Eucharist too. And this was not all, for legislators thought through some of the bodily proximities and the consequences of that proximity when Jews and Christians worked and lived together and, uh, and, and shared the same, the same spaces. And how intimate it was, they reflected, 
bishops and, and theologians thought how what that intimacy might produce in the new age of uh, regular, uh, regular annual communion. Uh, what more horrific than the fantasy that clearly animated the mind of some legislators, which is to say that if a, a Christian woman working in a Jewish house and who had uh, recently received the Eucharist and it was still in her body, Christ's body itself, which of course the theological complications here are too many to enter into, but the idea was that when she came to the Jewish house, either she would feed it to a, to a Jewish child through her breast milk, as a wet nurse say, or oh, worse, or is it worse, the Jews would force her to what we call today express the milk, the milk coming out of a body still animated by bits of the, by, by materials uh, that are, that originate in that ingested uh, a body of Christ. Clerics may all imagine that most extreme case and in great detail. Jews were imagined therefore as harboring all sorts of ill intent towards Christ's body in the form of bread and also disgust. So through the debates of monks then, the discussions of theologians and the legislation of popes, a whole new mode for apprehending this now uh, uh, this absent God is very present in, in, in material around, accessible, uh, were devised. It saw the move from uh, the Eucharist as mere memory to a very real presence in people's lives. Transubstantiation, as you'll remember, was formulated probably around 1180 in the, universe, in the, in the schools of Paris, not, not, yet a not yet universities. And it spurred a whole lot of intellectual and pastoral and organizational initiatives so that once it is the case that the drama, the annual, the annual drama that defines Christian membership in, in, in membership in the Christian community takes place at the altar and of course daily for every priest, then that space had to be clearly defined, regulated, uh, protected, uh, uh, kept a, danger kept away from it and it be, um, and it be a, a place uh, suitable for the celebration of this extraordinary uh, mystery. The efforts to make this promise convincing and consoling took the form of many scriptural arguments, homiletic persuasion, and of course the ritual performance. The mass was attended by a whole range now of material supports that appealed to the senses as well as to the emotion. So it was work of design that very often defined itself as an attempt to build a carapace, a sort of cordon sanitaire around the Eucharistic space so that doubters and heretics and Jews might not break through. And the horror of horrors, like the horror of a Eucharist ending up in a pix in a Jewish house, let alone in the milk that might be feeding a Christian child, is just, are just some of the uh, extensions of this anxiety to keep Christ's body safe from all. So that fantasy of the Eucharistic abuse coincided, of course, with the whole new sensibility around the crucifixion, and this is with this I shall uh, come to the end of this lecture, a whole new way of apprehending the crucifixion, the crucifixion in a world when Christ's body is now understood in wholly new and interesting ways by increasingly better provided and better taught and more in frequently instructed members, uh, lay members of the Christian community. No, that's just to show you a picture of what, how, how uh, abuse of the Eucharist was imagined as being. So just to remind you, in that first millennium, in, in the, in the, before 1000, on the whole, representations of the crucifixion in, in Western Europe tended to be quite muted. They tended to usually just have the body of Christ, maybe sometimes John and Mary either side, not much happening in the background, not much uh, situated, not a lot of, you know, just the way it is there, like in that uh, English uh, Psalter of around uh, 1,000. But by the 13th century, and in keeping with whole new trends in, uh, in uh, spirituality and in teaching, and the emphasis on Christ's suffering and the identification which it must elicit in you, the believer, comes so much to the fore. And now we have a new type of crucifixion, probably most dramatically captured there in that panel from Duccio's My Star. Look how busy that scene is. And two very obvious groups, the one to the right of Christ, the group around Mary. Mary now, as you see, fainting practically uh, with her suffering and emotional sort of turmoil, and the other group of those baying Jews, active, making faces, spitting and whatnot. 
Such scenes, of course, have no basis in the gospel. The gospel doesn't provide this sort of colorful, some elements, but not all the new colorful elements that came to reside in it in the 13th century. Led by the very fertile imagination and the devotional priorities, often of the friars, by the thrust in preaching and teaching to inspire compassion and participation in every believer, underpinned by the teaching, of course, of the Eucharist that sort of animates and valorizes the crucifixion and its aftermath. All of this delivered in sermons and in religious art too, this new passion was eloquent and it became the subject of new forms in liturgy, hymns and visual representation. And what is new and powerful here, and I hope you will agree, is the casting of the Jew now as the enemy of both mother and son, cause of bodily pain and her emotional suffering. By the later Middle Ages, the emotional content became more explicit and it invited participation from viewers very, very explicitly too. Uh, by 1300, say, Mary suffering at the foot of the cross was associated with the Jews very, very directly. The lessons of mother love, and I'll illustrate that in a minute, the lessons of mother love formed the basis for lessons of hate, I think. The Jews became the antithesis of Mary's love, of mother love. As Christ's suffering became more humanized and graphic, the role of the perpetrators became enhanced too. Not everywhere, not all the time, but this again is the direction of development. And so a relationship between the parts evolved, an emotional economy of sorts, whereby there's this sort of cycle of love going on, Mary and Jesus, and then on the other side you have the Jews. And it's very, very directly uh, uh, articulated in the, um, of course it's there in, the, in some versions of the, uh, of the Stabat Mater, some of the uh, particularly vernacular ven renderings of them. But I'll just bring this to the end by uh, sharing with you some of the materials from the Laude. The Laude is a very specific type of uh, religious poetry in the various uh, Italian dialects, uh, very localized dialects that developed around the work of confraternities in the 13th century, particularly in Tuscany, later further north as well. And it's a practice whereby lay people who wanted to do more than what the parish offered or required, who wanted to do more in terms of enhancing their devotional life. And they created these sort of clubs and often maybe endowed a chapel and often guided by Franciscan or Dominican uh, sort of organizers who also wrote this type of uh, devotional poetry. And there without any question, it is always a cycle of ma you know, Mary and the Jews all around the body of Christ, very powerfully. So we get this collective chanting of the Laude by the lay population, enacting, often they're enacting a dialogue between Mary and her son on the cross. The two in pain and sorrow exchange love and compassion, often literary in a language, it's a little bit like sort of baby talk, highly alliterative, as a version from 14th century Urbino has it. Oh, son, 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 O oh, beloved jewel, son, who gives comfort to my anguished heart? O oh, figlio, 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 o oh, amoroso Giglio, figlio, chi dà consiglio al cor mio angustiato? And he goes, mamma, mamma, your heart is indeed pierced. In Urbino, the Marian confraternity viewed the drama of the passion unfolding in stages. Down the white flesh, the red blood trickled. Behold the bit to life that Mary's son has had. This is my translation, I'm afraid. The crazed crowd ordained in council, death and destruction to the good pastor. Per la carne polita, currea sangue vermiglio. O reca maravita, cavera Maria del Figlio. Just to give you the sense of its very simple phrases, very alliterative and very, very uh, simply rhymed. So the culture of bodies in suffering cast the Jew center stage and situated Jews on almost every altarpiece, part of the lessons imparted in a new type of European sentimental education. Thank you.